It, it's got to be an incredibly hard balancing act because you, you didn't you didn't have, you know, your three-star freshman for all of practice or even games early on. And then, you know, coach, uh, coach you know, is out for a month. So you take over. You don't have that consistency. Grayson goes through his thing where he's suspended indefinitely. Like, there's been a lot of kind of moving parts. So uh, it, this is a little bit like what, what Tom Izzo said after their loss. Are, are you guys getting better even though the results haven't proven out as such in the last couple of games. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that. So, you know, the first game that we did not have Coach K was Boston College. And we had played very well the game before his last game against Georgia Tech. And obviously you look at what Georgia Tech did last night. They've beaten North Carolina, so they've beaten two top ten teams. It's a good win, and we played great, and we won by 50-plus points. And then we're playing against the Boston College team the next game. The first game coaches out, and we're dominating the game. And with about five, four or five minutes to go in the first half, Emil Jefferson gets hurt, and he goes out, and he can't play. And then he misses the next two games. And so we didn't play as well in the second half against B.C., and I actually thought we did some good things at Florida State, but Florida State's a top-10 team. I actually thought we did some good things against Louisville. I mean, it's a one-possession one game with about two minutes left, and this is without our most important player in Emil Jefferson. And so I, I did think that we were getting better. We came back. We, we lost two games on the road against two top-10 teams. We come back, we have a great week of practice. Again, it didn't translate for whatever reason in the first half against Miami, but then we got it. And so I thought we got better, and then we it, we played in spurts against NC State. We didn't do it consistently, then I thought we got tight, and then they were magnificent, and Dennis was tremendous. And so I do think we've gotten better in some areas, but it hasn't been as consistent as we need it to be in order to change this thing. Um, yesterday, uh, the piece was released, and I don't know how long you worked on it, uh, but if people haven't read it, I, I tweeted out, I put it on Facebook, you should go and just you know Google Jeff Capel, and you, you penned a piece in the Players' Tribune about your dad telling the world that he's fighting ALS. Um, what was it like for that to come out? What, what, was, what was the feeling like for people to know what you and your family are going through off the basketball floor? Well, you know, it's interesting because... I started working on that uh, over Christmas break, and I came up with the idea like in early December. It actually started, we were up at the Jimmy V, and you have the Jimmy V week. And obviously there's so much, especially in our sport, uh, for cancer, and there should be. There should be everything for cancer, What, what you know, an, an amazingly uh, awful disease. Um, and obviously this is the ALS excuse me, the disease is very personal to me and my family right now. And I just started thinking, like, I, I don't know a lot about it in sports, obviously about Steve Gleason, you know, catfish. I know that, but you don't, you don't hear a lot about it, especially in basketball. And I just thought, okay, what can I do? We went to a dinner, a fundraiser that my dad's doctor uh, had, and it was two other families there along with my family two other families that are dealing with this. And that was really good for my family, especially my parents. It was the first time my dad was around people that he had really gone out in public. This thing has been private. No one knew. My dad was diagnosed March 3rd of last year. Right. And so we're almost on a year. And uh, I knew right then that I wanted to do something. We wanted to do something. And my dad, at, at that point, after that dinner, said it was okay to, to, to do something. He didn't mind it being public. My dad is very private. And so my brother and I have been talking about different ideas that we want to do. We're going to do more fundraiser and different things. But I knew that I wanted to do something like this. And so the Players' Tribune was started and owned by Derek Jeter. But Blake Griffin is a, is a partner. And uh, I... I, I Talk to Blake about you know what I wanted to do. Blake actually knew about it. I had shared it with him, and uh, he got me in touch with the people at the Players Tribune. So I started working on, on this over Christmas break. Uh, you know, did the edits. You know, obviously talked to my parents about it, let them read it, my my brother, my wife, and and you know the story came out yesterday morning. And I, I'll tell you what, the response that we have gotten. Uh, has been incredible, overwhelming. You know, I talked to my brother last night, and he was just like he had to put his phone away because we've been dealing with it, in, you know, like in our own private way, but now to hear other people 
And, you know, the one thing that's really cool about it is that you, you, you find out, and I'm sure you did this. I know, you know, what you've gone through with your dad, uh, you, you know, with his passing. You find out even more how much your father means to people. You know how much he means to you, but your dad was a coach like mine, is uh, you know, you find out how many people that he's touched. And that's been the really cool thing, some of the messages that I've gotten on, on text, on, on Facebook, of what my dad has meant to them has been incredibly cool. You know, it's, it's amazing because my dad didn't want anybody, and nobody knew he was sick. I mean, there were some people who knew he wasn't well, that he looked different, that he was losing his hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but he didn't want to tell anybody, and... I think in his mind it was he didn't want people to treat him as he was dead, like he was dead before he was dead. Yeah. On the other hand, you want your dad, to, you know, you want your dad to hear how many people care about him, have appreciated yeah. all. So it's a how how hard was it though to allow him to you know a, allow this story to be out? It really wasn't. You know, once he gave the okay, you know, one of the hardest things was not telling people. Uh, because like you said, my dad, you know, if, if you saw him, the very first thing you say is like, wow, you know, Coach Capel's lost weight. And you could say, you know, hey, man, you've been working out, you're doing right, this. Right. And so you re- like, like, like you wouldn't really know until he started talking. And then you would say like, man, you know, you've been drinking or, you know, what's what's going on? And that's how we knew something was wrong. We didn't know what it was. And certainly the last thing we thought would have been ALS. Uh but because of that, like you want people, and so it was really hard not to. It was really hard for my mom, but obviously, because you respect, you know, my dad. Like it's it's his news to tell, right? And so, like what my mom was dealing with of knowing it, but not having anyone to talk to about besides my brother and myself. I mean, she didn't tell her sister. You know, she didn't tell like her closest friends because it's not her news to tell. My dad didn't tell any of his family members you know, his brothers and things like that. And so that part was difficult, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, all the things you go through as a family, the worry, the care, the doctor's appointments and things like that, um, especially when you know there's, there's not a cure uh, and, and you know kind of what's coming. And that it's, it's scary. Uh, but, again, my dad's actually doing very well. Um, you know, I, I don't get to talk to him as much because he doesn't really like to talk now because of his voice, but he texts me after every game, you know, before every game and all that stuff now. I go down and see him. So he's he's actually he's able to drive still and work in his yard and do all the stuff that he normally does. All right, so 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 take me through what this is like for you emotionally. Y- you get a chance, and many people believe that you're the heir apparent to take over this incredible program. You get a chance in the middle of a season where you got the Grayson thing, Emil's hurt, uh, you've had the fresh and be hurt, and then you have this going on in your personal life. Like, is basketball cathartic? Does it? Are you allowed to focus? Does this motivate you more to do a great job so that you're absolutely the guy? Does it give you perspective? Like, what are the, all those emotions like while you're doing your job? Well, it's very emotional. Very, very, very emotional. Uh, just the, the stuff with my dad is very emotional uh, because – you know, my dad has been my best friend. He's been my hero. He's been like, I, I actually could touch my hero when I was growing up. I could be with him and talk to him. I didn't have to look to a guy on TV. And so to know what he's going through, to know what my mom is going through, like that breaks my heart. But again, they're incredibly positive. So it's emotional that way. As it pertains to my job and all the stuff here, like, look, my my big thing from the very beginning is like, this is not an audition. I don't look at it that way. You know, I went through this as a player in 95 when Coach was out for an extended period of time, and that year it happened to be the rest of the season. It's not going to be that this time, so it's very different from that standpoint. My big thing is my concern for our players, our concern for our players, uh, because all of the guys that have chosen to come to Duke, myself included, you, you, you choose to come here to play for Coach K, and Coach is not here. And that's difficult. It's, it's difficult for everyone, and obviously we're worried about him. Uh, the basketball stuff is kind of cathartic for me because anytime I've had difficulties or things, I've always gone to basketball. The one part that is the most difficult, and at times it does make me emotional, is like after games. I remember after, uh, you know, I can't remember, maybe it was after Florida State. I re- yeah, I think it was after Florida State. I texted my brother that night, and I said, this is – 
this is one of those moments where I would love to be able to talk to my dad, yeah. not to text with him, but yeah. to talk to him, you know, during that time. And so that's when it kind of gets me, you know, after every game when I was a head coach and even when I was here, since I've been back here before we got this diagnosis, the first call after every game was my dad. You know, I would call my dad or he would call me and we would talk about what what he saw, you know, what's going on, how do you feel and things like that. And so those are the times when I really miss that, like after games, being able to talk to him. Now, again, we text, but you know, man, it's it's different than hearing your old man's voice. 